Have you ever wondered who the very first grunge band really was? Well, if you guessed Green River, you would be wrong. I want you to picture a time before the internet, before all music was readily available to download, and before the massive cross-pollination of all genres. Before this, what would usually happen is that a new and exciting movement or a scene would start brewing underneath the surface. Journalists, photographers, and DJs would soon start to pick up on the excitement and start writing about it to generate buzz. And eventually, if a certain band was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, they would rise to megastardom and become symbolic of this very movement or subgenre. But there is also a massive problem with this type of narrative. In retrospect, we only seem to treat the bands who were symbolic of a certain sound as the sole innovators of that particular genre, which they almost never were. There have always been creative masterminds in the underground who came way before them, who received not even half the recognition or the credit for their creative genius. These original creative masterminds almost always become a mere footnote in the story, if not ignored for their contributions altogether. And it is no secret that many of them were not the skinny white guys who figured out a way to repackage a movement and sell it to white teenagers. To quote Simon Reynolds of The Guardian, History is definitely not written by victors. There are dozens of bands who made landmark albums but never achieved more than an abiding cult status, earning the dubious consolation prize of being an influence and reference point for megabands. Hundreds more made just one or two amazing singles, then disappeared with barely a trace. Over decades of new rock movements and subgenres, the uncredited innovators behind the scenes were often women, specifically black women. Before Little Richard and Chuck Berry pranced and waddled their way into the nation's hearts, and long before Elvis sent the public into collective hysteria by shaking his hips on live television, gospel singer Rosetta Tharp was shouting into the heavens, flanked by a choir of backup singing men, ripping out these fat, intricate guitar solos, creating an entirely new sound that laid the foundation for rock and roll. In the punk scene, we had polystyrene, the quirky DIY zine maker, fashion icon, and exuberant frontwoman of the self-proclaimed deliberate underachiever punk band X-Ray Specs, who wrote satirical socio-political commentary about the construct of fame, authenticity, and identity, with a distinct saxophone-laden sound and Polly's distinctive high-pitched yowls that would put John Lydon to shame. I talk a lot about feminist historical recovery in music on this channel, and I am eternally grateful to all of the hardworking archivists, record collectors, journalists, and scholars who are working tirelessly behind the scenes just to ensure that the stories of these women do not disappear or evaporate completely. Which brings us to grunge. And we cannot talk about grunge without talking about Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington might be one of the most important landmarks for rock revolutions to catapult DIY music into the mainstream. With Riot Girl and the eventual explosion of Nirvana's Nevermind in 1991, and the subsequent success of Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, and Hole, just to name a few, Indie labels like Sub Pop and Matador soon became household names. When we normally think of grunge, the story usually goes that heavy sludge metal bands like the Melvins and noise rock no wave icons like Sonic Youth, although not from Seattle, still very influential, helped pave the way for later grunge pioneers like Mark Arm and Steve Turner's early grunge bands Green River and Mudhoney, before the eventual explosion of grunge, with Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit catapulting the subgenre into the mainstream. Or 
at least that's the cynical way of looking at it. But what if I told you that the wildly popular Seattle sound made famous by white men in plaid shirts, cardigans, and knit hats was actually started by a band that was led by a black woman? Well, that is true. And the fact that this band has been neglected in nearly every retelling of grunge? That is in no way the fault of people who weren't aware, because they essentially had no way of knowing. The story has been kept off the record for years. In the early 80s, singer Tina Bell had put an ad in the paper for a French tutor to help her with the lyrics of C'est Bon Si for a Langston Hughes production. The ad was answered by a man named Tommy Martin. A few years later, Bell and Martin married and decided to start a band, which they formed alongside their close friend Scott Ledgerwood, aka Scotty Buttocks. The band came to fruition with Martin on guitar, Ledgerwood on bass, and Bell taking on lead vocals. Combining their surnames, Bell and Martin, into an acronym, Tina and Tommy called the band Bam Bam. They later recruited their drummer, a man named Matt Cameron, who you may know as the drummer of Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. With their sludgy guitar tones and off-kilter rhythms on songs like Ground Zero, Stress, and It Stinks, Bam Bam laid the foundation for a sound that wouldn't become wildly popular until nearly a decade later. Bam Bam was one of the first bands to record at CZ Records and Reciprocal Recordings, the place where Nirvana would later lay down the tracks for what would become Bleach and Incesticide. The Melvins even opened for Bam Bam when Kurt Cobain was still touring as a roadie for them. As written by Jen B. Larson in PleaseKillMe.com, Evidently, the right people had heard Bam Bam, enjoyed them, and even recorded them. The band's recordings are solid, they're attractive and talented, with a bombshell lead singer. So why wasn't Bam Bam included on Deep Six, the 1986 CZ Records Seattle Showcase compilation that featured Reciprocal's early grunge recordings? Unfortunately, I think we all know the answer, an answer that many black creators know all too well. As Scott Ledgerwood said, America was certainly fucking not ready for a black girl up front in a hard rock band, let alone as a media sweetheart, no matter how gorgeous she was. As for Bam Bam being suppressed, there's probably several reasons, but race and gender clearly played a major role. The continued reluctance by Seattle to accept her is maddening. Part of it is that people are uncomfortable around the race issue. It's like kill the messenger when I try to talk to folks about it. According to many eyewitnesses and insiders who witnessed Belle's aura firsthand, she was an incredibly magnetizing, high energy, exuberant, and regal figure. She had killer vocals and the band played like motherfuckers. As a sludge metal proto-grunge band, you would think it would be common sense, a no-brainer to acknowledge that Bam Bam played a vital role in shaping grunge history. But instead, barely anybody remembers them. And if you are one of the many people who hasn't heard of the band before, that is no fault of your own. There's virtually nothing about them on the internet, save for a few archived websites, a Facebook page, and a few YouTube videos. Tina Bell's Wikipedia page was recently deleted for quote, lack of sourcing. The book Everybody Loves Our Town, A History of Grunge, doesn't even acknowledge Bell's existence, and Bam Bam is wrongly labeled as a three-piece. How does that even happen? How does one become so blind to what is right in front of them to the point where they don't even acknowledge the lead singer? Bell and Martin had a kid named TJ, who eventually grew up to be a filmmaker and won an Oscar for his documentary, Undefeated. And the Oscar goes to... Undefeated, TJ Martin, Dan Lindsay, and Rich Middlemass. On the KEXP Sound and Vision podcast, TJ revealed the heartbreaking injustices that his mother continues to face, both in life and death. Any of her, like she was a writer and a poet and a yeah. vocalist gone. They threw it out. I didn't find this out until, 
because they threw out immediately. I didn't get the call that she'd passed until two, you know, like a week after or something yeah. like that. So when I come out there, I'm like, where's her stuff? And they're like, oh, it was contaminated. We had to throw it out. And they saved like a DVD player, a chair, and like a weird poster. That's it. So my brain can't help but take it here, but she remained, she continued to get disrespected even in death, right? Yeah. There's no yeah. way someone would do that if it was like a high rise apartment, you know, million dollar apartments. You ain't throwing out everything in someone's belonging, you yeah. know? It's hard to come to terms with that, but it also makes me realize that she was privy of that the whole time. And that came out in the music, and they came out in her performance. And at a certain point, it got exhausting. Because Tina Bell is no longer with us, that makes it that much more important to recognize her rightful place in the pantheon of Seattle rock. Her legacy is just as important as that of groups like Heart, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Nirvana, if not more. As Jen B. Larson so eloquently wrote, it's more than time to crown Tina Bell as the queen of grunge. And not just as a woke PR move, but because it's the truth. 